Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Hey, is this is Yeah. This is a little I've got sort of an outline, and I'll follow that. You're welcome to interrupt me, but uh, I think we'll have, I think this will finish fairly, I don't know how long it'll take to go through this, but, but we'll definitely have time to go in for questions. If you so, I'm going to assume that we're starting from the beginning, that, that, that some of you are here for uh, without a lot of experience with flexible news. And, uh, and so, I really want to share my enthusiasm with them because I, they, they really turned me on. So, I'll tell you a little bit about my history. I got interested in fountain pens uh, at around uh, fifth grade. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I had a, a, a teacher, a male teacher, who was quite authoritarian and, uh, and made a big impression, particularly I think on the boys, <coughs> on the boys in the class who kind of were a little startled by his, uh, his strength and, uh, and power. And uh, he corrected our papers with a broad mint fountain pen. A Parker 51, I discovered later. <laughs> and, uh, and when he put an X next to your admission problem, it was, it was unmistakable. <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember spending that year dying to, to, to try that pen. And he would not let anybody try his pen. So it was, a, it was sort of a prolonged tantalization. What year was that? that let's see, that was uh, that must have been around fifty-eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of what brand of pen was it? Did it was a, it was a Parker. 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 Oh, Parker, that's right. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. so I think that left an impression. And um, so the next year there was a fad in our school that uh, that was I don't know if you, it, how many of you remember those those Schaefer transparent. Cartridge oh, yes. film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, well, they hit it big in our school, and everybody had to have one. And then if you had a blue one, they had to have a green one. If you had a green one, they had a red one. And what did they cost? They cost a dollar. Oh, like, yeah. They were one dollar. And uh, so they lasted a few months, and everybody had one. And then it seemed like they kind of drifted out, except for me. I I I continued to use one for years, <laughs> and then sort of expanded to, to, to spending my allowance on an enormously expensive fountain pen. It was $7.50. And, uh, and was so embarrassed about this, I didn't tell anybody. And then a few years later, I, bu I bought a $10 pen and didn't tell anybody because that was even more embarrassing. And, and, it was, and this, this went on for, for years until about 1992. When uh, when I had a pen that didn't work, that it cost two hundred and twenty-five dollars, <laughs> and it really disturbed me. I sent it back to the factory a few times until they stopped wanting to repair it, and I got pissed off. And AOL had come out at that point, and so I went on AOL and discovered that I could that I could uh, I I could. They had something called profiles on AOL, and I could search the profiles and find pe other people who had pens in their profile. So I wrote a whole bunch of people and said, "Does anybody else have this problem with this pen?" Because Parker's giving me a pen in the neck about it. So, if that, with that exposure, I got many responses. And discovered for the first time that there were such things as vintage fountain pens. There were such things as pen shows. There were, there were, and I was not the only one. It was very clear who was obsessed with these, mm -hmm. these, these things. And uh, and and the world has changed ever since. <laughs> so um, my first love was smoothness, and I was pursuing smoothness in pens. That that was just. Things that just kind of glided across the page, the, more, the, the easier it more easily glided was what turned me on. And then I met Susan Muth at my first pen show. And Susan 
Uh, I don't know how many of you know Susan or remember Susan. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, Susan was, was it, we lost Susan a few years, a couple of years ago, and she was just a, a, a giant in our field. And she was uh, uh, beloved by, by many people. And so I was at her table, and she was famous for, uh, for kind of introducing people to different pens and helping you find something that fit your hand. And so I was trying out these pens, and I was looking for smooth, this one was smooth. And the person next to me had been a, a woman who was, had been given a pen by Susan. And it was different than anything I'd ever seen before, because it, it bent a little bit. The tip bent when, when she used it. And not only did it bend, but it went from a, a medium to a very broad and laid down a lot of ink, and, and I was, first of all, mesmerized, and then I wanted to try it, and, uh, and then I asked if she had another one, <laughs> and, and so this was the first flexible nib that I had ever encountered, and it not only took smoothness, not only was it smooth in, for, for my taste, but it had this additional excitement that, that it could also vary the width of the line, and that was that was quite exquisite and kind of uh, artistically, not that I'm an artist, but just artistically, kind of challenged my mind, and and I I really liked it. Well, it was quite an upsetting day because this woman bought that pen, which I wanted to buy, and I had my first real experience of pen envy and, and, and disappointment and, and disappointment. And uh, I got the other pen that she had given me, and, and that was my first flexible nib pen. It was a, a, a very early, maybe Todd. It was very flexible. It was a I'm broad, sorry, what? Maybe, maybe Todd. Okay, got you. That's a name. It was a broad nib, maybe, and and it, it, it spread even further to probably twice as broad as it, it already wrote. And it was it was it, it was just great fun, and I just it it, it opened a door for me. So. Uh, what did you pay for your first pen? How much did I pay for that pen? For the yeah. flex pen, I guess, or that pen. Yeah. Oh, golly. Because uh -huh. AOL was around years ago. So that yeah. was not too long ago. Yeah, this was probably about 1993 or something like that. It was, um, I think it was like about $75 is my guess, is what I paid for it at that time. Yeah. And, I, and so let's see. So what is it? What is a flexible nib? These are I, so I fielded some questions out to people on my mailing list, and a number of people uh, responded with with ideas of what they wanted to hear. Uh, 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 John did, and, uh, and John, Robert, 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 and Elaine, and uh, and really helped me to kind of put this uh, to think about what to to talk about today. So. Um, what is a flexible nib? A flexible nib, basically, the so if this is looking at the side view of a pen, of a of a nib, here's the pen back here. The nib will actually bend when you put pressure on it. And the effect on the point, when you bend it, is that this slit in the middle actually allows the tines, these are tines, to spread. And so they, this pen will look like when it's got, when, it's, when pressure is applied to the paper, it will look a little bit like this. And the, the, what do you call it, the property of uh, liquids to adhere to its, itself, what's that called? Capillary action, well. Well, you'll we'll hold the ink here <laughs> so that the line changes from this wide to this wide. Uh, because the, the, the ink actually <laughs> is held and, and makes a wider line. So this is wonderful because it, 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 it kind of allows you to use the pressure on the pen, on the paper, 
to to play. <laughs> so and I like to play with them. Um, Did you discover that maybe some of the softer gold nymphs would also allow you to have some flights, not actual flights? So. That they're softer, so could they? Did I see that the, the, the gold the itself, like eventually, as opposed to other materials, or? Well, no, when you had regular gold knit pens, did you discover that versus stainless steel, that they were they would allow you to have modest, very modest flex. I don't even know if that's called flex. Would it would it widen? The, you know? <coughs> I mean, I mean, gold nibs can be very rigid. Gold nibs can be can be flexible. And, it, and are you asking sort of what allows, make, what, what is it that contributes to a particular nib that allows yeah, it to is flex? Gold, is gold probably the best for, for it? So it, gold is what's more, most commonly used. It, it lasts the longest, it's, it's inert, it doesn't, uh, it, the acid in inks doesn't upset it. And, but no, they're actually steel nibs can be, can be flexible. And we were just talking, uh, John and I were just talking about, uh, 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 well, we were talking about Les Shealy, who has Stylophile upstairs. And he's been cutting nibs in a way that, that scallops them and kind of uh, makes them flexible, quite flexible. So it doesn't have to be a, a, a gold nib, but typically it is a gold nib. Most of the time. And, um, yeah. and, and John, a, a flexible nib is intended to be a flexible nib. Yes. It, it's designed that way. The, the manufacturer has that as the intent. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, also, John, you know, the, the, the big problem when you talk to the modern pen manufacturers, they say they can't duplicate the the metallic content of these old flex nibs, and that's why these, these guys, these modern manufacturers, can't really duplicate that. Is that correct? I don't think it's so much that they, it, 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 there's a lot of, let me, let me come back to that, okay. because that's a good question, and, and what is the difference between the new nibs and the old nibs? We'll come back to that. Um, so, a little bit of history. The, the, the history of, the, uh, of flex nibs is pretty natural because the, the in terms of writing back in the 1600s, 1700s, it was done uh, to a fair extent almost exclusively with, uh, pet, with uh, feathers, with plumes. And the plume, the, the point of the plume that was cut in a certain way with a slit on it was was soft and it was flexible and it led to you're all familiar probably with the, the lettering of the Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. which is a good example of that and that was written with a plume and uh, and you can you know, I mean the characteristic kind of thin and thick uh, lines is is it is is part of that document so as the Industrial Revolution went on and people started to, to make these things and try to make them in newer ways, uh, steel was used and uh, metal and, uh, and dip nibs were developed that were made of metal that are still used today in a lot in calligraphy. Those metal nibs are, are some of them are exquisite and just lovely. Uh, they write very, very fine and they can write can, they can be all different shapes. So um, those nibs uh, were used for, for many years. Uh, it was around 1888, I think, that Waterman first developed the first fountain pen. Uh, and, uh, and then reservoirs were developed and gold started to be used because uh, the fountain pens were more expensive and they wanted the gold nibs to last. Um, and gold started to be used. It made sense at that point when those early 
fountain pens were being made to make them to emulate the pens that were being used that were well, happened to be flexible because that was the kind of writing that people were used to and that they, they, were, they were doing. So the early uh, fountain pens have some of the have have probably have the most flexible nibs, and you're asking about what was special about those nibs that that uh, that they could do that that the manufacturers today are trying to 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 emulate, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, so just to follow the history a little bit further. Um, so that was the case until the competition developed between some of the big companies. The Waterman, Walnever Sharp, uh, Moore was a big one at that time, mm -hmm. um, Schaefer. And as, as these companies revved up with the, with the improved industrialization, uh, they were, the competition revved up. And uh, as the production revved up, the competition did. And they began competing by offering more and more comprehensive warranties. So you've probably heard of the hundred-year pen that was supposed that was guaranteed for a hundred years. There was the another pen was uh, by another company had a lifetime warranty, a lifetime Schaefer, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, it began to they began as they began getting pens back uh, to be repaired it became clear that the flexible limbs, which typically are thinner and more fragile than the, the thicker nibs, uh, which are more rigid, that, that, that was going to be, that was going to create, that was starting to create a loss. And so the companies, a lot, I think that along with carbon paper and the need to press down fairly firmly led to, uh, I think, a cutting back on the, uh, on the production of flexible nibs, and the, the companies pretty much universally began to make more and more rigid nibs, and this was around 1940 that that began to change. And so, as we look at nibs, and particularly myself looking for flexible nibs, uh, I tend to look for pens that are that are pre 1940 <coughs> because they're they're more flexy and they. I, in my mind, they're kind of more fun. And uh, the later pens, you could look at a lot of pens. They still, there were still some flexible nibs, pens with flexible nibs made, but they are much further and farther between. So when I go to a table and I'm looking, I automatically go to the black hard rubber pens because by that time, by 1940, there were celluloids and plastics and. Mm -hmm colors and a, an easy way to, to, to find the more flexible nibs is to look for the black hard rubber pens, which are the earlier pens. Um, so what goes into making a flexible nib? We don't really, we don't know for sure why those early manufacturers were able to make them so special. One thing we do know is that they got individual attention. These were not these were not mass produced. They might have been they might have been mass produced in terms of their 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 shape, mm -hmm. but they they got individual each nib got individual attention, and there were there were specialists at these companies that uh, that made uh, and we don't know exactly what they did. We know they ground them. We know they polished them. But we don't know whether they they pounded them and annealed them, whether they heated them and cooled them off. Uh, we don't know their, whether they use a little bit of a different alloy uh, in the material and in the, in, the, in the gold added something to the gold. But uh, those were the things. That, those were some of the things that they did. We do know that that the shape of the nib made a difference and. If, if a nib sort of looks something like this, uh, we know that if they extended these, these tines, so that each one of these halves is called a tine, and made it 
longer and thinner. Then that would be a more flexible pen. And if you look at it there, um, you can fairly, you can predict to some extent. At least you want, if you see one that has a long time like that, then I'll just hold one up here. So this has a little bit. But if you want to just pass that around, you can look at <coughs> it. Then that's an example. This is an example of one that has a, has long times. And uh, so later on in mod more modern times, another technique was to uh, to sort of cut away. So looking at this diagram here, this mid, just looking at it sideways, so the pen is being held like this, and we're looking at it sideways. Um, people will take a scallop out of that nib hmm. and actually cut that away. And that'll make this a little bit more flexible in here. And that's what uh, I think that's one of the things that Les Sheely is doing with steel nibs. Um, and that's there's a company, what is it, is it Namiki? It's one of the Japanese companies. Yeah, yeah. It makes the... Uh, it's like they have uh, canards, or <laughs> they look like they have yeah. a, uh, two bites were taken out. So, uh, it's called a falcon. It's oh, called like the mm -hmm. falcon. Yeah, that's part of it, yeah. And <coughs> the falcon is made, is made that way. Um, so, is it safe to use a vintage flexible nib when I break it. So that's a, that's, a, that's a really important question, partly because one can. Uh, these nibs are more fragile. And like any metal that, that is soft enough to bend, it'll, there's a point beyond which it will, it will spring back to its original point. And if you push too hard, it's going to bend. And it can be what we call, um, what's it called? When we, uh, sprung. Sprung. We can sprung. <laughs> it. Yes. And, uh, and so that is the, that's really the one thing that one has to be a little bit careful with. Well, that's not the only thing. One, uh, so one needs to be careful that one doesn't push too hard. If one knows that one has a firm hand, it makes sense to, to get a more rigid nib. Um, and maybe a semi-flex nib. Because that will flex enough with firm pressure that and it won't it won't it'll have enough strength to withstand a heavy hand. John, how do you gauge that though? I know the first time I was at your table. I was afraid to push enough to even make a difference. Yeah. And you kept saying press harder, press harder. Yeah. And I was afraid to do it. Yeah. So this is a little bit hard because if, there, if there's no easy measurement. And, and when people come to my table, that's a typical experience. People are timid about, about pushing on a flexible nib. And I know just from experience, and it's, it's a hard thing to, to, to describe. If someone comes to my table and I, I, will, I will show them with each individual pen how hard they can push comfortably without, that, without threatening mm -hmm. the integrity of that nib. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have an easy to follow rule, uh, but I can, tell, I can tell you a couple of things. One is when you, pick, when you pick up a pen for the first time, and you're about to try it, mm -hmm. you very surely mm -hmm. want to start with a little pressure and not go full bore. Um, um, so the the so I think if you kind of gradually increase the pressure um, as you're as you're writing, 
you'll get the feel of what it takes to flex that nib if it's a flex nib. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to flex, you'll, you'll figure that out quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I don't I don't have a I, I wish I, I wish I had kind of a a a clear signal. I mean, one clear signal is if you begin to press on a nib and the tines spring back mm -hmm. afterwards and they close to that point that they started out, you're probably fine. Mm -hmm. If you start to push on a nib and and you notice after pushing a certain fir with a certain firmness that it's not coming back fully to center, fully to close, that was too much. So it's sprung at that point. No, it's not sprung. It's not sprung, it's not sprung at that point. It's just it's it's you strained it, and it's 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 immediately repairable. I mean, it happens to me, and what you do at that point is you kind of push this a little bit over, and push that a little bit over, and you bring it back. But now you know you don't push that hard again with that nib, and uh, and it comes back, and it's not been damaged. It's not sprung. Sprung is when you you. Pushed it so hard that it bent, and there's a crease. Oh, I see. And that's 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 done. You need some. That's yeah. less lights out. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's the best way to, to describe it. Okay. Um, now, other things that you do have to be a little careful about with a flex nib is that, especially if it's an extra fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that it's sharp. And mm -hmm. with the time spreading, it's possible if you're writing, particularly if you're writing fast, to catch mm -hmm. on the paper. And so when I start out with a, with a pen that I haven't used before, I kind of do a few scribbles to kind of see, you know, if I, if I make a circle, is it catching at any point of that circle? Because if, especially if it's a, if it's extra fine and a delicate pen, which are my favorites, mm. um, I'm going to want to be careful. I don't want to. It's it is possible to kind of go you know really fast, and then all of a sudden you've caught an, caught an edge. You want to find out if there's an edge to be caught early mm -hmm. when you're being careful with it, but. A really nice flexible nib pen. You can you can do this. You can go all over the place, and it'll just it'll just be fun. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, how to use a pen for everyday writing? So a, a flexible nib pen. A flexible nib pen is 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 made for everyday writing. And, and one doesn't have to, one can use it for everything. It's, uh, if one has a, a, a broad nib, obviously you're going you're gonna to start closing your, your, your little E's, your minuscule E's, and it's going to be hard to tell an E from an A, and, uh, and if you have a fine, so it's, but, that's, but, but if, if you have a fine or extra fine, It'll be a little more legible just because you won't be closing loops. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think it's actually easier on one's hand to write with a flexible nib. It gives you a little cushion underneath, and it uh, uh, it's more comfortable. Um, and one doesn't have to get fancy with uh, I mean taking notes in a in a class or whatever in whatever context one's using it. Uh, you just just writes like a like, like a regular pen, but gives you a little bit more. You want to sign your name. It's kind of it gives you a little a little. You can give it a, a boost. That's how I use the Pelican you sold me. The uh, I very very seldom invoke flex or consciously. It's just a great pen to write with. Oh good. Yeah. You don't want to let it sit for more than three weeks with ink in it. It could dry out and just be a little bit harder to clean. Mm. But uh, there's no special care that's involved. Uh, what, will, what will a flexible nib do for you? Um, 
I, th I think what it enables, it enables you to have fun, to kind of have a little more artistic flair with your letters, if you, if you care for that. Um, um, to give emphasis on a signature, you can, you can emphasize the first letter of your first and last name, kind of give it a little uh, oomph. Um, I think writing with a flexible nib slows you down a little bit, and so it can improve handwriting. And if you, so I included in this uh, in this handout uh, an exemplar. Uh, this is the uh, exemplar of letters. Now these are these are copper plate letters uh, that are. You know, if you wanted to write real fancy, these are beautiful letters, I think. Mm. And, uh, and so if one wanted to, to begin to learn, say, that A, uh, that capital A, one might, uh, and let's say one's, one might just apply more pressure to that first downstroke People familiar with what a downstroke mm -hmm. is? So, so literally, an upstroke is in this direction, a downstroke is in this direction. And if I were writing my if I were writing a J for my first name, I write it sort of like this: upstroke, downstroke, upstroke. And so on the downstrokes, I might put extra pressure. Mm -hmm. So let me do it again. I'm doing light on the upstroke, heavy on the downstroke, light on the upstroke. And for my, the capital letter of my first name, with a flexible nib pen, it would, it would give more emphasis to this line in the downstrokes. John, it doesn't work if you attempt that on the upstrokes, right? You're just going to snag the, the, the nib. So, especially, so with, with a, yes. So, generally with a, with a flexible nib pen, you're putting pressure on the downstrokes and going lighter on the upstrokes if you want to do a calligraphy kind of a letter. If you just take a note to just writing, you don't even have to think about it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it's not required. And so I think people have this sort of idea that, that you have to have a be really good with your hand in order to do to use a flexible nib. That's just not true. It's only if you want to do a calligraphic letter that that then that extra attention to whether the line goes up or line goes down gives you that pizzazz. Um, and I do think it, it improves handwriting to, to use one because as you as you write just normally with a flex there, I it makes one want to it still looks so nice. <laughs> um, it does it does uh, so learning calligraphy and I have tried to learn calligraphy. Mm -hmm. I'm not a calligrapher. Although I, I, I will brag that I, I did my daughter's wedding invitations, uh, that uh, that it it, t it 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 requires practice. It um, and I'll share with you if if some of you want to improve your handwriting, I'll, I'll share with you my my technique for 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 practicing, which is basically to. A bottle of whiskey. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some really good swing jazz in the background. Um, to get some wonderfully smooth paper, because paper makes a huge difference in how smooth mm -hmm. the, the writing is. And to use a, a exemplar like this, like and choose one letter. Whatever that letter is that you particularly like, and you know, if you, these are like so. And I would just take one letter. I would see how it's made, and take the A, 
and I would just copy it. Is that it? Yeah. A little bit more like that. And then I do it again and again and again. And then the music would come on and I'd sort of like go, <laughs> da da, da da. I let the music kind of give me a rhythm to kind of play. So I'm getting mindless about this. But at the same time as I'm getting mindless, I'm getting mindless with this A. And I get, I'll go 10 minutes and uh, and then at some other time when I'm feeling like doing this, I'll do this with a different letter. But it's just, uh, for me, that's fun. And, uh, and, it, it, and little by little, you, you develop the letters. But I don't think of it as work. I don't think of it as, as, as uh, anyway, that's, at least that's, that's how I approach it. It's made me happy. Um, So another thing that can, that can, in terms of how one uses a flexible man, um, the if one if one wants to, to kind of improve one, one's handwriting, if one wants to 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 work on developing some calligraphic letters, um, tips are. You, you can see that there's a, that I, I borrowed Deborah Basil's uh, guideline here. And this is it, the, the, the typical copper plate angle is something like 54 and a half degrees or 55 degrees. It's emulated here. And so it's, it's roughly like this. And so if one, one's handwriting looks much nicer if one writes with all the downstrokes going in that at that angle. It looks nicer than, than that. And <coughs> so so just so the downstrokes here go this way and and this way and this way and this way and this way, whereas on this script, it's, they're all pretty much going in the same in the same line. Totally unimportant to, to, to taking notes and to and to just you know writing for practical purposes. But if one wants to, to, to play with it and, and make improvements, that's a it's an easy thing to think about. It, another another thing that makes has helped my handwriting is <laughs> if I don't have a line to write on, is imagining a line so that I'm not I'm not writing um, mm -hmm. um, trying to imagine a line. I mean this is obvious, but it's mm -hmm. but it's just when one's writing these are just things to think about. You can also just stick this behind the paper you're writing exactly. on and book that, That's how I use it. <coughs> yes. This, so this, uh, it, this line thing, exactly what John is explaining is most paper you can see enough through that, that putting this behind it allows you to, to look better than you really are. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> Um, so shading is the term that, that, that's, that's used to refer to sort of putting a little extra push on the line. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I've, I've implied this already, just that it, one doesn't have to shade every single letter. One can just choose. 
first letter of the last name or whatever the school wants to apply it. Some people, in my early days, I would shape every letter just because I got a kick out of it. And then I kind of realized that it actually it looks better, I think, to my eye, an occasional letter. And uh, but but this is the fun of it. You can you can do it the way you want. So shade um, means just the heavy side. Just the heavy side. So the downstroke. The downstroke. The shade on the downstroke. Um, these are just some guidelines. If it's a very flexy nib, it's a delicate nib like the one that I passed around. Is quite a, it's extra fine, and it's. Uh, probably more delicate than a big broad nib, uh, you wouldn't press as hard, or you'd be careful not to press as hard. Um, does everybody know what railroading is? Railroading? No. Okay. So, if you, if you, let me see how to do this. If you press, if you press too hard, and the tines spread far enough, and the flow doesn't keep up, Look at instead of getting one thick line for shading, you'll actually get two lines, so that the, each time will write. But it but it it's called railroad because it looks like a railroad track. So so John, that's railroading is speed. It's not that you're putting too much pressure. No, right. Oh okay. So it, it it will remedy if you slow down. Got it. Because of this, huh. the, the flow is not keeping up. Well, that's interesting. And, and that will happen with any flexible nib. Mm -hmm. um, some less than others, but if you go if you go fast enough, it will wear over. You're saying it'll happen with any flexible nib, but not with any nib. Not with any nib, because a, a rigid nib is going to stay together and it's going to write a single line. Yeah. Is it also because the nib is coming off the feed? When you start. It? The nib is coming off the feed. That can be, yeah, that can trace to it too. So you have yes. starvation. That's yeah. right. Starvation of the nib. That seems to be the main problem in the modern manufacturers trying to duplicate it. Like oh. nib, they get real rolling, right? Oh, yeah. Isn't that the main so I, I have to confess, I don't know the, the modern flex nibs. Oh, well, I have a sharp and yeah. uh, Omas, they're all trying to. I, 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 I'm not real familiar with them. I'm sorry? Newlers has some too, cheap, the cheap uh, flex. Yes. Nibs. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can you answer that one question in here? Because I, I, I for one did buy a cheapy flex noodler, and it was just not. I it didn't do what I wanted. I learned nothing. Um, it didn't. It was not a learning experience for me. So which question? Is uh, uh, the, the near the bottom of the second uh, page. Is it, there. Worth it? is it worth buying a cheapy? So my feeling about noodlers is that it, it just barely doesn't really have enough flex to it. I can't even call it flex. Okay. Um, I, I, I like that somebody's trying to make an inexpensive flex. Right. But it's it's so... It just doesn't make it. It's limited. Yeah. And so I... The, 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 trying to find a... a, a an inexpensive flexing is hard. <laughs> and how are we doing for time? Okay. A few ten minutes. Okay. Um, advantages of vintage over contemporary. I know the contemporary pens are uh, the contemporary flex pens. Uh, I know they're fairly expensive. Aren't they like seven hundred dollars and up? Or are they something like that? Well, if you get a Simone or something, I, I, the, the so Simone, the, they have these these new sort of they do flex. It's like a universal type of nib that they have on. It's enormous and it's it can flex. Yeah, but not like it. Not enough. Like it's I, not the same. I haven't seen it's a lot. Of, you have to be flexible. So this. my impression is that they're they they, 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 they sure. it's fairly expensive and that they're that for the price actually, I think you get a lot more for. Uh, for your dollar with a vintage nib because you can get vintage nibs, vintage pens, pens with vintage nibs for a couple of hundred dollars or even even less and, and you can find nice ones. Um, 
um, what to look for when buying FlexNib. So every, does everybody know the difference between extra fine and fine and medium and broad? Mm -hmm. Is that pretty well understood? And, and so you want to know, you want to have an idea of what fits you in terms of your use of the pen. Some people just like to kind of see a lot of ink when they when they write, and some people like you know to have a little fine little. So knowing what to start with in terms of my first thing I want to is to is to select I want a pen that starts before it flexes to be extra fine or fine or medium, and uh, and then. I think it's important to try a pen before you buy it. There are a lot of people, there are a lot because flex pens have got have gotten to be in such demand. To buy on eBay is is, is very difficult because it uh, you just don't know what you're gonna get. And and you can push any pen hard enough to make it flex it, to make a, a, a to give it some shading. But what you don't know when you see a picture on eBay is how hard did they push, and is the and and <laughs> it's very easy to get to not get what you want and end up disappointed there. John, on that point, what is a reasonable range? I think the one I got from you was a fine, with a little bit of pressure. I can sort of get it to a medium plus, but it would be unrealistic to expect an extra fine be pressurable all the way up to broad, right? Actually not. I mean that would be a that would be a very nice, probably more expensive deal. Right. Um, but you but there such things exist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, price ranges. Um, I I think that if you find a really good deal on a table and you just happen to find it and the, and the, 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 the seller is not particularly into or uh, aware of or care, doesn't care about whether the nib is flexy, you can still find pens in the $60 to $150 range that are, that are flex and that have nice flex, but you have to hunt for them. Uh, most people, a lot of people now, once, once they recognize that a pen has flex, they'll boost the price, and that's just the market. Um, um, steel versus precious metal. I've used most most steel nibs are more like you were saying, Santiago, are 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 more rigid, but. Uh, and, but there are flexible steel nibs that are that occasionally you come across. I don't know how they're made, but some of the Italian pens, like Omega and uh, Monte Grappa, and uh, they those in, back in the 30s, they made uh, steel nibs that were very flexible, and some of them are very nice. Uh, so it, it's not it's not just that it's gold. <laughs> 